Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. We are now in the fifth week of this um, course, which I hope all of you are finding rather interesting and rather useful. Um, and starting this week, we have a new motivating image which is uh, that of a spacecraft uh, from SpaceX specifically um, that is hovering around the Earth. And uh, the algorithms that we seek to design um, are also uh, driving systems such as these, uh, you know, so that they can reorient and move autonomously in space. So uh, now starting today, um, we will look at a new set of course notes right? and uh, this is just a sort of preliminary, uh, not a preliminary but something that uh, precedes uh, adaptive control, right? Um, adaptive control literature was preceded by identification literature and uh, it was rather well known that uh, for any uh, parameter identification to happen successfully, there was a rather a certain requirement for richness of signals. And this richness of signals was uh, regularly codified um, in terms of persistency of excitation. All right. So until last week, we, we sort of completed our discussion on, uh, well, I mean, until the last lecture, um, we completed our discussion on, I mean, the Lyapunov theorems and the different variants, right? And now, uh, today, we are uh, ready to delve into um, topics on persistency of excitation, all right? So, like I said, this uh, precedes uh, what we did in, uh, what we will do in adaptive control. Um, so chronologically, it in fact came before uh, the adaptive control literature. Um, of course, you will also see that um, there is a healthy connection to stability um, because we are talking about parameter convergence, which is a sort of stability problem, right? So there's a healthy connection to stability. And so we will look at some alternate uh, exponential stability theorems and, and so on. And, and so this is what we will discuss um, for the rest of the week. Right? So uh, let me warn you, we are already starting to get more and more mathematical. So the topics are uh, getting more and more mathematically involved. Right? So uh, I would expect you to spend more time um, trying to understand the material, going through the material and be comfortable working with the material and use it in different problems and application contexts all right great so let's begin so the first thing uh, we we sort of talk about is uh, uh, what is the definition of persistency of excitation right? so vector signal phi of t is said to be persistently exciting so this is a more uh, how would i put it a, a definition in words right? and then of course we will define it more mathematically so the notion of persistency of excitation is that if the signal wobbles around enough in every window of length t, right? So if I have a sliding window of time, so I keep sliding the window of time, right? I keep moving forward, 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 right? In time, uh, over each this each of the each such window of you know length t, I want the signal to wobble sufficiently enough or move around sufficiently enough, right? And it's made a little bit more formal saying that the integral of the dyad associated with it is positive definite. Right? Again, you look at a more mathematical, uh, mathematically precise version just down below. So we don't have to worry too much about understanding this. But dyad is an operator which is a combination of two vectors. Okay. 
so here in, in this case it is basically referring to an inner product all right in this case it is referring to an inner product right so so what are we looking at the, what are the elements here in the definition there is a sliding window of time of this constant width t capital t so we have kept a cap t window of time and on each such window we are looking expecting the signal to you know sort of wobble sufficiently right so that some kind of positive definiteness of a diode is achieved all right so without again um, all elements of this are not very clear just by this definition in words so we actually look at the um, the more formal mathematical definition for our purposes that is uh, when the signals are in when we are looking at uh, vector signals in rn right so that is if there is an integrable signal phi from r plus to rn then it is called persistently exciting if there exists three constants mu1 mu2 and capital t all of them positive such that this kind of a uh, integral inequality holds what is this integral inequality and this has to hold for all time small t so this is what it means to have a sliding window right because as i change t my window start to slide okay so changing t means i'm sliding the window because this capital t that is the uh, range as the of uh, this integration remains the same it remains capital t okay but it's just that i'm changing the initial time from which i began all right great so what does this uh, inequality sort of mean let's just try to interpret it right so the first thing to remember is that this matrix phi phi transpose is uh, um, belongs to r n cross n all right so it's an n cross n matrix that's the first thing to remember the second thing is this is in fact positive semi definite right because it's a symmetric uh, first of all it's symmetric because it's just product of phi phi transpose so if i take the transpose it's still phi phi transpose so therefore it's a symmetric matrix and it's it's like a quadratic right? so because it's phi and phi transpose therefore it can never be uh, uh, you know negative it can never have negative eigen values we already know if the matrix is symmetric then the eigen values are real right so we can talk about positive and negative eigen values um, but we also know that this matrix cannot have negative eigen values because it is a you know, it's like a square right if you have any confusion in understanding this you can just think of it like if i multiply both sides by some uh, constant vector say v transpose uh, phi tau phi transpose tau v suppose i do this because i can move this in and out of the integral if i do this then you know that this is actually a square right this is actually t t plus cap t uh, phi trans uh, yeah phi transpose tau times v square d tau this is the norm squared this is the norm squared and this is like something like an x transpose x x transpose x that is the norm squared and the two norm squared right and the two norm can never be the norm can never be negative right therefore this entire quantity has to be greater than or equal to zero right now you know that if the quadratic form is non-negative then the matrix has to be uh, positive semi-definite at least okay so that's really the argument it's like a square therefore it is positive semi-definite at least but we are claiming something more something more we are saying that it is in fact lower bounded by mu1 i which is strictly greater than zero so therefore somehow we are saying something about the eigenvalue of this integral all right because if you remember for any symmetric matrix we had this nice inequality right what was it it was something like x transpose ax less than equal to lambda max a norm x squared and lambda min a 
norm x right which means that uh, the quadratic form is lower and upper bounded by the largest and smallest eigenvalues right therefore if i write it in this uh, nice form i'm just if i write it in this form all i'm saying is that the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix with the integral of course is has to be greater than or equal to this mu1 so the smallest eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix being greater than a being greater than or equal to a positive constant means what it means that this is a positive definite matrix okay this is a positive definite matrix the other side is rather simple it just says it is some kind of a bounded matrix right? so the, there is an upper bound on the eigenvalue of this integral and so it's like a so it's a simpler condition in fact many textbooks define this without define persistency of excitation without this right hand side so i would not put too much of a stress on this side right? so it's more of a, a question of how you want to do the math that's about it right so so what's the idea what's the idea so we are saying so the first thing we know that the integrand is greater than or equal to 0 what else we know that phi phi transpose singular for each t yeah why is that why is phi phi transpose singular for each t see phi itself is just a vector what is the maximum rank of a vector one now if i take product of two matrices then the rank of the product is less than or equal to the rank of the each of the matrices right so now what am i doing i am taking two matrices vector is also a matrix right? and i take their product therefore the rank has to be less than equal to the rank of each one of them which means the rank of this whole thing is less than equal to one can be at most one is what i'm saying so the rank of this product is at most one so this is rather interesting right i'm saying the rank of this product inside the integral is at most one but i am saying that when i integrate this quantity over this window of time then the rank in fact becomes n because if the rank doesn't become n this cannot become positive definite which is what is indicated by this inequality right because or even or an even simpler idea this is less than or equal to the smallest eigenvalue which is positive so we are saying that the smallest eigenvalue is greater than or equal to mu1 which means what which means that all eigenvalues have to be strictly positive which means i am somehow saying that although the integrand has rank at most 1 the integral over this time window of capital t has rank n has maximum rank so this is the rather cool property that we are looking for and this is the property of persistence of excitation right so we therefore which is what is mentioned in this note the matrix itself phi phi transpose is singular for all time so the p condition somehow requires that the phi rotates sufficiently right such that phi phi transpose is uniformly positive definite why do we say uniform because these bonds don't depend on the small t yeah mu1 and mu2 are independent of the small t you remember that in all our definitions uniformity has always got to do with the time argument all right so in this case that time argument is the small t if mu1 mu2 are independent of it so you keep sliding it doesn't matter where you are your bounds remain the same because if they don't then you are sort of it's rather troublesome yeah if you don't have uh, you know a uniform bound yeah then you will not be able to complete the sort of analysis that we try to do all right 
excellent right so we start with a singular a vector we make an outer product phi phi transpose is an outer product we know that it is symmetric we know it's positive semi definite we also know it's singular with at most rank at most one yeah but the cool feature that we are looking for is that when i integrate it over a window of time capital t i want it to become positive definite of course i also expect it to remain bounded this fine not a big deal okay not asking for much there all right great great so so that's what is sort of we are saying we create an outer product this condition has to be valid for all small t and we slide window of size capital T and phi phi cross is symmetric positive semi definite yeah but if when we do a moving window average it is positive definite so if we do moving window average it's always positive definite so this is rather um, this is rather strong all right so let's look at some examples right of, of uh, what kind of systems are in fact uh, you know persistently exciting or what kind of signals are in fact persistently exciting so the first example obviously is a scalar signal you know, well we most a lot of our examples are scalar signals but whatever you can construct the vector counterparts uh, without too much of a trouble right the first very very easy example is a uh, constant signal right the constant signal is of course persistently exciting yeah obviously and its lower and upper bound are exactly this value itself and the lower and upper bound will be exactly c and therefore it is uh, trivially persistently exciting yeah if you integrate uh, this over c d tau t to t plus cap tau you will always get c t irrespective of what is your uh, small t all right and therefore the lower and upper bounds are can be exactly capital T C times capital T so one of the things you can remember so I mean so I can actually mark this to be my mu1 and mu2 yeah so one of the things to remember is that uh, <clears throat> these uh, mu1s and mu2s uh, can depend on capital T okay so a lot of times again one of the things that is done is this, this this definition is again taken uh, with a one over capital T to do sort of an averaging out right? to do sort of an averaging out so that T doesn't appear in these constants so this is another thing that is standard okay definitely not non-standard so so that you average it over this time capital T yeah and without this this is not an average it's just a summation I mean if you think of you know breaking the integral of course yeah uh, but with this one over capital T it is a sort of average right so that's why we call it you know this this um, a word moving window average is being used all right so here also if I do one over capital T instead of just yeah so in fact sorry this is C C this is C squared right so this is just this guy okay so mu1 and mu2 are in fact just c squared c squared because it is phi phi transpose so in this case it's c squared right great 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 so this is a, like we said this is trivially persistently exciting no problem okay so let's look at another example yeah of course this is sort of example where the signal can possibly hit zero right this 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 was trivially persistent because this never hit zero anyway yeah so we are not worried about this signal so much the next one is something like this is a periodic signal with a period capital T itself which is this window size right and what is this function it is a max of sine t and zero okay and of course we take capital T to be 2 pi okay because that's the period of this signal so we take the max of uh, sine t and zero right and this is also uh, so basically the purpose of this is to somehow make sure that uh, you you don't go below zero 
that's all i mean not that it matters yeah not that it matters so much in fact in fact i could just take instead of this something like a f of t is sin t right and t 0 to 2 pi right and now if i take t equal capital t equal to 2 pi then i'll be doing integral from uh, some t to t plus 2 pi and sin t so sorry sin tau d tau sorry sin squared tau d tau okay right something it's basically sin squared tau d tau right so what is uh, let's see so now i'm i want to basically use uh, see if I can uh, integrate this right um, let's see yeah let's let's try to do this okay so this is something like this is equal to t t plus 2 pi sine squared tau d tau and i do want to see if i can use some kind of a trigonometric formula can i do that uh, let's see Yeah, I think 1 plus cosine 2 tau will be equal to 2 sine squared tau. I believe this is an uh, let's see. I believe this is an inequality. Uh, cos squared t. Because cos 2 tau is cos squared tau minus sin squared tau. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think this. I think we can use something like this. Because cos 2 tau is cos squared t minus sin squared t. So this becomes sin squared t plus sin squared tau. Yeah, yeah. So this is 1 minus cos 2 tau. So this is this guy and if i integrate this i will get something like tau minus half sine twice tau and this is t to t plus 2 pi so the first term will just give me 2 pi and the second term uh, will be minus half sine uh, 2t plus 4 pi minus sine 2t right so what is sine 2t plus 4 pi because this is just uh, periodic with 2 pi so this is actually going to just cancel yeah so i'm going to be left with 2 pi yeah, and if I actually took a 1 over 2 pi here or a, so 1 over or 1 over t here which is 2 pi itself 1 over t here so this is 2 pi by 2 pi and that's equal to 1 okay so this signal is also persistently excited okay so pretty straightforward I just integrated the square of the signal right because the, the outer product if the signal itself is a scalar then the outer product is simply the square of the signal and that's what i did and it's not difficult to compute that this is also persistently exciting now uh, if you look at this kind of a signal um, again i mean i don't need the squared here if you look at this kind of a signal uh, 
f of t is e to the power minus t sine t so this is actually uh, we're not going to compute it but but i mean let's see so if you look at how the signal evolves uh, this this will you know really start to decay very fast all right so if you look at this I mean, we make this envelope it right? can e to the power minus t right if you make this envelope then what will happen is that this sinusoid will lie between this and it will start to decay very fast yeah very fast it will start to decay very fast now this kind of a signal is not persistently exciting yeah i'm not actually computing the interval uh, the the integral itself i would leave it to you folks to try to compute this right but this is going to be this is not going to be persistently exciting right why because this is sort of decaying and now what happens if it decays especially exponentially yeah uh, what happens is that this integral over this window of capital T right I mean I make a window then I move the window move the window move the window and so on and so forth you can see I get smaller and smaller pieces smaller smaller amplitudes and in fact this amplitude will somehow be scaled by like an e to the power minus t and because I get smaller and smaller amplitudes you will see that um, my mu1 and mu2 for a particular window start to get smaller and smaller and the thing is if the mu1 and mu2 get start to get smaller and smaller i get to choose only one mu1 and mu2 right it has to be uniform in time mu1 and mu2 cannot depend on t right so if i keep moving the window and this amplitude becomes smaller the corresponding mu1 and mu2s come out to be smaller for each of these windows then the only thing i can choose is the smallest mu1 right i can only choose the smallest mu1 and the largest mu2 so the largest mu2 is not a problem because i'll just choose it from the first one but the smallest mu1 if you keep going on and on on and on and on you can see that this is going to become really really tiny so the smallest mu1 i can pick it's just like that uniform stability argument the smallest mu1 that i will be able to pick is in fact zero yeah and if the mu1 that we pick is zero then this is not persistent because we require this we require mu1 to be strictly positive okay because we already know it is semi-definite right we already know that the outer product is semi-definite no magic there what we need is that the outer product be the integral of the outer product be strict significant is strictly positive definite that is be you know if you take an average over this window of time t to be strictly positive definite and that's why we need a uniform window right uniform mu1 yeah independent of the small t all right so this kind of a signal is not persistently exciting and yeah? these are uh, for the purposes of identification these are not good signals yeah so so if i may these are not good for identification all right these are not good for identification so anyway so what um, so I, I'll sort of summarize what we did today and what we're going to do subsequently right so uh, what we started today was a discussion on persistence of excitation right and this is a uh, a rather rather important notion in parameter identification all right and uh, we'll sort of try to connect it in basic ways to parameter identification in the subsequent lectures but today we saw the definitions of definition of persistence of excitation and we also saw what kind of signals are in fact persistently excited right? um, so and it really just in, involved computing a simple integral of an outer product uh, and in fact for the more complicated cases it's not difficult to verify this numerically also all right so it's not that difficult to do a numerical verification 
um, and so like I said subsequently we'll start looking at how this is connected to uh, your adaptive identification all right great so this is where we stop thank you mm -hmm.